you go, so I'm sent till. So I take care of uh, the programs at Jesse. My colleague Sarah Shiler also participating in this event. And I, I would like to introduce Dr. Mostert for our colleagues. And uh, so at this point of time, we have around 10 on board. And then as we get more uh, alumni, they can uh, join as we progress. So Dr. Moster is uh, the director at Institute for the Future Studies, uh, Futures Research at Stellenbosch University in South Africa. And also, he, he is a global uh, iconic uh, person in terms of the futures thinking and the research and leadership. Uh, I'm sure most of you would have glanced through his profile and very, very exciting uh, profile. And we are very happy and thankful for him to accept to do this consultancy. And also uh, for the seminar, seminar today, like a webinar. Next one hour, um, we will uh, see the presentation and you will have an opportunity to interact and clarify some of those uh, things you wanted to clarify from the blog. So at this stage, maybe uh, let me not take uh, too much of time. So Dr. Mostert, over to you, please. Thank you so much, Sintil, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us uh, for this really, very exciting blog. It is, um, it's an honor to be with you, and I'm broadcasting uh, to you here, as you heard, from South Africa. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, as you've heard, I direct the Institute for Futures Research at Stellenbosch University, and uh, we are the first and indeed uh, remain the only Institute for Futures Research anywhere on the African continent, which is uh, rather a strange thing, uh, rather surprising that only one such institute should exist. But I think that that is really because of the particular view that we have of the world, the way that we think about decision making. And I'm very honored to share some of those uh, principles with you this afternoon. Please do participate. Please do pose your questions. We're grateful to Sarah for um, being there in the background, uh, helping us administering the process. So most of you uh, would have seen the blog. I, I hope that you've read through it. I don't want to repeat um, sort of paragraph by paragraph the blog, but I'll just give you some headlines and then perhaps I can uh, have a broader conversation and respond to some questions if you're comfortable with that. So the title of the blog is uh, Towards a New Futures-Based Decision-Making Framework for senior leaders in Africa. And perhaps we can just reflect a little bit on why such a title. The first principle is that uh, we are engaged in a decision-making process. And as we look around at the African continent, we could ask with, uh, I think with reasonable justification, whether the current leaders in Africa are in fact making the kind of decisions that will create uh, a profitable, viable, feasible future for the continent. And one way of uh, making a high quality decision, in our view, of course, is to make that decision future based. Now, for many people, this is a little bit of a strange idea. The reality is that most of us make decisions, of course, based on the past. In fact, that idea is so entrenched that many people might say, how could you possibly make a decision based on anything else? Well, our argument is essentially this. The only place we could possibly go, the only era, epoch, time zone in which our decisions will come to life is the future. It can only be the future. For that reason, it seems deeply flawed that such a large proportion of decisions are in fact made based on the past. So this is a classic intellectual dilemma. Decisions are made based on the past, but they're in fact made for the future. In other words, they're made for a time that we're going to, but they're made based on a time that we're coming from. Now, of course, the past is important. It's easy to argue that it has value. Of course, we all have a past. That's where our experience comes from. It's where our education was. Um, it's where our relationships were built and so on. And I'm not here to diminish the value of the past, but I am simply saying this. We can only move towards the future. Therefore, our decisions must be made not only for the future, but indeed based on the future. 
we have a little bit of a dichotomous relationship with time when we think about the future. And some of you will have seen in the book that there is a matrix in blue and orange that shows pro and anti, past and future. And perhaps I can pause for a moment just to reflect on what I mean by that matrix. If you have that matrix in front of you, you'll see that in the blue uh, blocks there, you have pro and anti, and on the orange blocks, you have past and future. What I tr I'm trying to illustrate here is that for many decision makers, in reality, the level of integrity that we have within uh, embracing the future is not always where it should be. So if we look at those quadrants, in quadrant one, you have the past about which you have a favorable view. In other words, you are pro the past. So these are people who defend the past. And of course, it's easy to defend it. And mostly the argument is that the past has value because it is based on tradition and it has a cultural value. Of course, our culture can only have been shaped in the past. In other words, if you favor the past, then you say, I'm favoring an old idea, which is frankly sometimes outdated, because it is based on a tradition and because it is cultural in nature. But if I oppose an idea from the past, if I am anti the past, if you like, then in quadrant two, my argument is that I don't favor the idea because it is antiquated and irrelevant. In other words, you can immediately see that the past can be viewed either favorably or disfavorably. Now, the same can apply to the future. If I favor the future in quadrant three, if I am pro the future, then I argue that these ideas are novel and they are innovative. But if I oppose the future, then I argue that these ideas are unproven and untested. In other words, it's clear from that matrix that we have a, a dichotomous relationship with time. Sometimes we favor the past because of its traditions. Sometimes we favor the future because of the novelty and the innovation. So it's clear that the quality of ideas um, is sometimes influenced by the past and sometimes influenced by the future. So our view, as I've said, is that decisions should be made not only for the future, but indeed should be based on the future. And this is where I think we have a very important contribution to make as an industry. <coughs> Most of our work is uh, with industry and uh, some of it with, go with, uh, with government also, and then also with postgraduate students. And in that work, we, we share a number of principles, a number of sort of datums, if you like, based on which we then say uh, the thinking about the future must be based, principles that guide that. And perhaps I'll just have a look at that blog and share um, and share some of those principles. The first is that, of course, you cannot predict the future. That doesn't mean that you can't say anything about the future. It simply means that we cannot say with any perfect certainty. Now, in this instance, the past competes very well with the future because it's a great deal easier to say concrete, provable things about the past. That shouldn't, however, mean that we should favor the past over the future. The fact that you cannot say something with complete certainty <coughs> does not imply that you cannot say it with any certainty whatsoever. The second point there is that futures is what we refer to as an exospect of science. Now, in a lot of business schools over the last two decades, especially in the domain of leadership, there's been a tremendous focus on introspection. In other words, look inward, look inside yourself, understand yourself, and use that self inside in a way that uh, allows you to manage yourself. Now, of course, that's not wrong. But if we want to be competitive at a national level, and if Africa wants to be competitive at an international level, it is also equally important that Africa should look outside of itself. Why is that important? Because if you look inwardly too much, you begin to conceive of yourself as a little bit of a special case, a bit of an exceptionalism. You start obsessing with your own character, your own quality, your own way of doing things. Now, of course, it's easy to argue that Africa must awaken its own <coughs> way. But I'm simply arguing that in addition to that, we must also 
not be afraid of what's going on outside of Africa. And for African countries, so at a national level, this is also important. Here's a classic example. We keep talking about how Africa should, um, you know, become more pan-Africanist. In fact, the African Union encourages African nations to think in a more pan-Africanist way. But it may surprise you to learn that intra-Africa trade as a total percentage of GDP in Africa is only at 12%. In other words, countries in Africa may philosophically adopt the idea of pan-Africanism, but in reality, African states simply do not trade with each other. The third point I make there is that a spectrum of multiple past complementary futures are, are possible. What I mean by that is that we are not victims of the future. The future is something that should be embraced. It is not something against which we have to protect ourselves. Now, there's often dialogue around the fourth industrial revolution that, you know, the robots are coming. Africa must brace itself. What we would say is, of course, Africa should embrace this rather than try to protect itself from it. The fourth point there is that the future is studied within a complexity paradigm. And really what we're saying here is that, that <coughs> requires humility. This is a very interesting dimension when we consider the sort of silly confidence of so many leaders who argue that they have a lot of experience and based on that experience, you know, they're almost certain about how things are going to play out in the future. If we perpetuate that kind of mindset, then we are also perpetuating, unfortunately, the problems of Africa in the future. We also say then at, at point five there that the same future may be achieved in multiple ways and an increasingly expanding array of ways, not only based on previous ways. In other words, there is more than one way to achieve almost any desirable future. This is a liberating idea that decision, -making, decision makers across Africa can accept rather than fearing what the future might hold. Point six there uh, says that exploring the future moves beyond simple definition or meaning to purposiveness. What we're arguing here is that we all want things from the future. And if you're going to make decisions about the future, you should be honest about what it is you want because it will influence your decision making. Therefore, the idea that you should somehow pretend that what you want from the future is not relevant, we think is fundamentally flawed. Number seven is a very exciting idea because it says that this means that the future is at least partially subject to collective decision-making. Now, Africa has a rich history of collectivistic approaches to decision-making. In the last few decades, we might say that that collectivism to some degree has suffered for a few reasons. One has been what you might refer to as the scourge <coughs> of brutal capitalism that has led to individual <coughs> individual rapaciousness, as our former president, Tabu Mbeki, has called it. But Africa brings a rich understanding of collective decision-making, which at least in our view, is one of the very exciting things that, off, that uh, Africa can offer to the rest of the world. Point eight says that we know that when we look at the future, it changes. It's a principle really from theoretical physics. The observer alters the observed. Practically, this means that the moment we start examining the opportunities that the future holds, it presents us with insights about how we can embrace those opportunities. Let's examine the converse. If we only look at recipes of the past, we will perpetuate recipes of the past, and that will imply that we will only get the results from the past. So therefore, at point nine, the quality of our cognitive processing, our conscious thinking processes, will impact the quality of your future. In other words, if we cannot think and make decisions at a high level of sophistication, we are in trouble for many decades to come. Number 10 says, by exploring multiple partial views, many views, all of which will inherently be partial, options for alternative futures may be generated. And then number 11 is one where we often have debates with clients. Because we have the very strong philosophical view that we cannot go back. Now, we have a number of clients, in fact, and perhaps there are some of you attending this webinar, who are involved in a program known as a kind of back to basics program. Some of you may have come across such a thing. 
why do we advise against the idea of a back to basics program? If you accept the premise that things change all the time, and I think most people in sophisticated organizations would agree, things do in fact change all the time. If you accept that premise, then the burden of proof for a back to basics program is absolutely enormous because the decision maker really has to uh, prove that number one, there is consensus on what the so-called basics are. Now, what are the basics for Africa? I'm sure there's no one in Africa who would like to agree that the basics in Africa are HIV, are TB, are malaria, are dictatorships, are corruptions, are sort of isolated mindsets, paradigms of non-collaboration. But of course, it would be easy to prove that those things exist. Those would hardly seem to be, to me, the basics to which Africa must somehow return. And even inside one organization, one government, even inside one government department, to return to basics means that, that the, the, the basics that we select is someone's opinion of the basics. We would say, why not examine what the future might be? The second burden of proof on, for a, for a back-to-basics program is that those particular basics must be deemed to be universal. So in other words, if you think that basics are, let's say, let's, you know, let's define the processes, for example, as, as an example of basics, you have to prove that the way that we define those processes are in fact universally understood. The third burden of proof is, and this is the most significant thing from a future science perspective, even if you could do number one and two, even if you could get consensus on the basics, and even if you could prove that those basics are universal, you would have to prove not only that the basics worked at a previous time, but that those very same basics would in fact work in a future time. Now, let's connect the dots here. If you accept that things change all the time, and you accept that it is not possible to return to the past, how would you then prove that the past basics are the same basics that will work in the future, a time that you have never visited. So I think you can hear the argument for us as future scientists that the burden of proof is simply impossible and you, you cannot defend even a proven recipe from the past as any form of evidence that the future is going to be successful. It's interesting when we engage with various stakeholders across Africa in, uh, in various countries, how we sometimes get a little bit of a kickback here, almost as if people feel that there's a, there's a vision of the history of Africa. This is not at all the case. To me, the excitement of the potential of Africa far exceeds the kind of, you know, battle-scarred history that, uh, that the continent has experienced. So, we believe that this way of decision making has significant implications for the way that, uh, for example, uh, sectors uh, operate across various other sectors. Up to around the, the mid to late 1980s, the world was really concerned with what we would call an analytical paradigm. It was about segmentation, classification, segregation. A social shift really hit uh, the world when the Berlin Wall fell in 1989. The, Bur the Berlin Wall was a classic kind of metaphor of segregation, separation, classification. Since the late 1980s, we've moved, we have made a significant paradigm shift from segregation and classification on the one hand to connection and integration on the other. Africa has been a little bit slow with this connection and integration. I don't here only refer to smartphones. In some instances, Africa is already taking the lead, such as in East Africa with financial payments. But what I mean is I've already alluded to the idea that um, intra-Africa trade is only at around 12% of total African GDP. So the reality for us is that the future is a systemic, ecological, interconnected world characterized by high levels of complexity and for that reason, our decisions are even more 
guided towards what future scenarios might be looking like rather than where we have come from in the past. And the ability to think in a cross-sectoral way to make connections between sectors and to create a kind of ecology of sectors, we believe is going to be an essential intellectual skill for leaders in the future Africa. This, of course, extends to policymaking. Now, in the past, Africa has had a fascinating history of policy, and certainly we cannot provide that history in the few minutes here. But one of the criticisms that we can lodge is that that policy, much of that policy in many countries, were in fact highly segmented. There was a recent classic example here in the, in the SADC region of uh, a policy agreed in one government department to declare uh, a certain geographical region as an area of unusual natural beauty. At the same time, another government department within seven kilometers of that area agreed a policy for allowing a license for a coal mine. Now, that is a classic example of segmented, segregated thinking. In each segment, the criteria was met. On the one hand, for the area of unusual natural beauty, on the other hand, for the coal mine. So both were correct. But when you connect the two, you understand that they cannot exist together. The coal mine would simply destroy the area of unusual natural beauty. So a systemic future orientation, we think, will help Africa to reduce some of its risks and access some of the opportunity from that future landscape. Of course, it is important for us to have an international perspective and connect some of this thinking with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. The idea of, it, of innovation, in fact, features very strongly in the Sustainable Development Goals. And in the blog, I've given you just a few examples. One of those examples is that the call for new thinking is clear from target 9.5, which encourages innovation. The 9B encourages technology development, research, innovation. Now, colleagues, innovation does not derive from repeating, simply copying and pasting solutions from the past. The future is likely to be much more exponential in its nature. We've already established the premise that change occurs all the time, but not only is more change occurring, the pace of change is exponential. It's no longer incremental. It's no longer following the regular pace of development. And the exponential nature of the uh, agenda of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals is reflected in targets such as 9.2, which wants to significantly raise um, the involvement of um, industry collaboration, double the industry's share in least developed countries, 9.C significantly increase it. The systemic demands are, are reflected in targets uh, like 9.3, which, which wants an integration into value chains and markets, not a separation. And in 9.4, of course, wants to make them sustainable. And in 9A, there are calls for resilient infrastructure development, while 9B also represents the call for ensuring conducive policy environments. So we should then ask, perhaps, what of sustainable development goal number four, quality education? Well, to what extent does this sustainable development goal encourage the kind of future orientedness that I'm referring to? We've already seen it reflected in some of the other targets. What about the specific target on education? Since we're um, at this webinar with the compliments of Jesse, I think education is important. Well, 4.3 um, makes reference of the university, but in fact, uh, much of the education reference is on pre-primary, primary, and secondary education. 4.4 does, as I argue, offer some enlightenment um, uh, with reference to entrepreneurship. And this is supported by 4.7, which encourages knowledge and skills needed to promote sustainable development. And of course, we would argue that that is an inherently futures-based competence. Unfortunately, though, uh, we, we do think that much of the future development of Africa will, in fact, be heavily subsidized by industry because we just don't see the education system catching up quickly enough, especially if we look at the demographics of Africa. Those demographics are really quite fascinating. 
here in um, in uh, the, the sub-Saharan African region, uh, we have an enormous potential to leverage what is known as the demographic dividend. The demographic dividend essentially measures the ratio of people of working age over the uh, number of people of unemployable age. So people ages aged uh, 15 to 64 as a percentage of those under 15 and over 64. Now, the next few decades for Africa look extremely positive when we examine the demographic dividend. In other words, the number of people of working age will by far exceed those of dependent age. We know that Africa has a, about 40% of its population under 24. UNESCO, for example, argues that by 2040, four out of every 10 young people on the planet will be an African. I have to say, I, as an African, find this a very exciting idea. We also know that, of course, the, the uh, continent is uh, urbanizing at an enormous rate. One study, for example, shows that the current total population of Africa, around just over a billion people, will in 2050 be the urban population only. In other words, the total population currently in Africa, about 1.1 billion people, will be the number of people in cities alone by 2050 in Africa. So Africa has an enormously exciting, potentially great story to tell about its future. If Africa is able to um, leverage this demographic dividend, the future of Africa is bright indeed. What are the key dynamics for leveraging this dividend? Well, it would include, of course, looking at education, which, which is why we at the Institute of Futures Research is excited by the work done by Jesse. It has to leverage not only the implementation of education, but a future-oriented, dynamic, innovative uh, education mindset, and then leverage the return on the investment from that education. It has to look, in our view, of course, at some of the priorities around the moral development of uh, people in the continent, which is interesting, especially because we're going to have such an enormous young population. So the wisdom of the elders somehow have to filter into how we think about the future, not because it's past-based, but because we want to engage the elders in helping us to design a more meaningful future for the continent. And then, of course, we know the other two big ones are health and economic prosperity. And if Africa is able to do that, we will see a very different continent indeed now. In order for the policy maker of the future then to advance the agenda of Africa in a future-based way, we may pose a series of questions that will help us to reflect. And perhaps I'll ask these questions and then we can have a conversation. Question one, and all of these are really quite tricky questions, I would say, for most policymakers. But question one, which of our obsolescent habits? You know that habits are things that we do in the absence of thinking. Now, which of those habits which have really become obsolescent, they're no longer in use, which of those habits have in fact led us to the point where we are now, where we can see a number of dramatic trend breaks? We see the emergence of a young population. We see the frustration of that population. Leaders, for example, that have had multi-decadal tenure and so on. Which of those habits have led to some of these trend breaks? The second one we may ask is, how do we discern the noise to signal ratio? And this is not an easy thing to do. Not everything that we observe on the horizon is a sign of things to come. Some of it is in fact noise, but we cannot dismiss everything that we observe in this environmental scan as noise. Some of it is indeed giving us a sign of what's to come. Now, do we as policymakers actively spend time reflecting on what those signs might be? Does our generation have a futures project? How could we create uh, the idea environment, the environment in which ideas can flourish where we can work on projects for the future. I was in Botswana recently and I was tremendously encouraged by the enormous development in the entrepreneurial sector in that country, for example. <laughs> Building entrepreneurs is a classic example of the, exactly the kind of futures project that Africa will benefit from. We could also ask, how do we overcome an apparent lack of political will, which we might call a crazier, and how do we develop courage that is also at the same time humble? 
I think we've all agreed that if there unfortunately have been some leaders in Africa who have been courageous, but certainly not humble. Um, in certain cases, not terribly caring of, of the people and certainly not developing scenarios for the future success of some countries that we can observe. So how do we in fact overcome what appears to be a lack of political will? What are we learning from our skunk works? And, and by skunk works, what I mean is the areas where we are experimenting. Now, the word experimentation might strike some policymakers with a little bit of trepidation. It seems to include a, a large degree of uncertainty. But what we would argue is that the future holds a large degree of uncertainty anyway. And research and innovation requires a mindset where we can build a kind of play area, if you like, a play area for ideas where we can experiment. It doesn't, of course, have to be in the mainstream immediately. But we can treat them as prototyping versions. And I wonder whether policy units are familiar with ideas of experimentation and rapid prototyping. Now, very important. If we want to take the lead, whether that is at a continent-wide level or at a national level or even at a government level, of what are we the harbinger? Where are we, in other words, the shining light of things to come? What is Africa currently showing as the shining light of things to come in the future of our beautiful continent. Where are those examples? And perhaps we could celebrate them. Where are we the vanguard or the bellwether across sectors? You know, what are we signaling to future generations? When future generations look at current policy makers, what are they observing? Do we even know what they're observing? And then what should we be designing as evidence of our leading anticipatory competence? So if we say, okay, you say, okay, Dr. Oster, we, we buy your premise. We will be future oriented. What is it then that we have to design to show each other in Africa as fellow Africans, but also show the international world that Africa is about to take the lead? Where are those areas for Africa? So, of course, Africa has been shaped by its past, but that's true for all continents. It is no longer a valid excuse for Africa and and policymakers in Africa to say, yes, but you must remember we've been shaped by our past. That's true all across the globe. We have to guard against the idea of exceptionalism and view ourselves, we have to avoid viewing ourselves as some sort of special case. It's fascinating when we engage with clients across Africa that there's this kind of dichotomy of exceptionalism and universalism. What I mean by that is, if we address an audience and we say, ladies and gentlemen, you know, Africa is a special continent with a special dynamic. And very soon in the audience, someone will say, excuse me, but aren't we all one? Is this not one universal humanity? Why must Africa always be treated as a special case? And then in the very next audience, we will say, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Isn't it exciting how we are all one? We are all one universal people. Someone will very quickly say, just a moment. Is Africa really exactly like everybody else. In other words, there's this kind of inbuilt dichotomy in the character, the identity, the definition of Africa. I think we should caution against going too far on the exceptionalism scale while at the same time protecting what is magical about our continent. So I argue in my final conclusion there that the quality of leadership decision making by leaders in Africa is critical to the future of the continent. Why is that so? Leaders exert influence. They have decision-making authority over resources. And those resources will shape what the future might look like. Leaders, I argue, may significantly enhance the leadership competency by advancing their ability in and orientation towards processes of thought that are in fact not only a copy and paste of where we've come from, much as we respect that, but are in fact oriented towards the future, and as we as future scientists would say, based on the future. At this point, colleagues, I'll say I'm grateful that you that you've uh, heard my presentation, but I would also like to engage with you. And so perhaps you you have some thoughts to share. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mosna. This is exciting. Uh... 20-25 minutes now. So it's really uh, thought-provoking and uh, 
So one of the uh, key statistics which you shared that the 12 percentage is in trade. That's very, very, very low and very shocking. <laughs> okay. There so, are a few um, shifts. Um, would, how would you like to uh, facilitate the session? Would you would you like uh, to nominate? Yeah, the uh, maybe. Uh, so I'll, I'll just. I think uh, Fadi also joined. Fadi, welcome, welcome to this session. And uh, Fadi, so here I will I will uh, hand it over to Fadi to facilitate. Fadi, over to you. Yes, thank you. Um, and uh, Dr. Mostert, it's an honor to have you with us uh, today. Uh, so and uh, to be able to discuss this very uh, important topic with you. Um, we, I fully agree with you that often we tend to uh, see the future and uh, in the light that we are victims of the future, especially since the future seems to be quite uh, uh, daunting if we look at what's happening around the world then it does seem as if it's uh, becoming more and more daunting and uh, you refer to complexity theory, which is something that has a role to play in this regard. Um, while you were talking, I was uh, taken back to the time when we started to develop the course and when we uh, uh, decided to have futures thinking as a central aspect in our course. Yeah. And at that time, we found it very difficult. It was about three, four years ago. We found it very difficult to convince universities <laughs> of futures research as an academic, uh, an acceptable academic methodology. Mm. Um, and uh, we were questioned several times about the validity of including and, and the feasibility and viable, and you know, uh, of including this in our course and making it such a central aspect. And we had to do a lot of convincing. <laughs> so I'd like to hear from you uh, with regard to uh, what is the status of futures research now uh, in terms of academic research? And uh, because there was a debate uh, about this at the time. Yeah. Uh, then I'd also like to know from you, uh, is there a role for indigenous knowledge systems in futures thinking and futures research, and what type of role, and uh, how to raise awareness about the value of futures thinking and futures based decision making amongst policy leaders in the pub public sector. Uh, what sort of approaches and what sort of uh, events and campaigns one can embark, embark on to ensure this. Now we are trying to, to lay the foundation with that through our course and you are trying to do that through your institute. Yeah. But uh, it is not something that is found, you know, this approach is not, not many public sector leaders are aware of this and not many are using it. So how yeah. can we make sure that this grows Yes, thank you, Patty. Thank you. Um, for a few uh, great questions there. Uh, let, let me start with uh, the status of future studies um, as an academic pursuit. Um, uh, as an hello, in can you just repeat the question? I cannot listen it. Hello? Uh, I, I didn't listen to the question. Can you repeat it? Or can you, can you paraphrase it again? Maybe I could summarize. Uh, Patty Swan yes, asked about the nature of future studies as an academic pursuit, um, the role of indigenous uh, knowledge systems, and the uh, challenge of spreading awareness of a, a futures oriented approach. Thank so, you. I'll, Go ahead. Thank you. So I'll, I'll uh, respond to them one by one. The, um, the, uh, on the nature of uh, future studies as a uh, scientific pursuit at universities, um, it's really quite, uh, there's a, we, in our view, uh, there's an emergence of this. We were established already in 1974 
And, but it's only in the last, uh, we would say in the last few years that, that the focus on the futures has really uh, picked up. And so we would say that the reason for that is the, the pace of change is accelerating. And the, the second reason is that universities are starting to realize, especially the more traditional universities, are starting to realize that they have to, they have to remain uh, relevant. So, you know, the sort of classic story of the old professor who has his slides from 1987 uh, that he still uses to, uh, to teach students, uh, of course, is no longer relevant and, and students are beginning to um, kick back against uh, some outdated uh, content and methodologies. So I think as the pace of change is increasing, the interest in futures is increasing. There are currently about 13 institutes, formal academic uh, futures institutes uh, around the world. Uh, our, our institute here at Selimosh um, uh, remains the, the only formal uh, institute. Uh, there may be other subjects offered, and um, I think you're a very good example of that. Um, there's an institute, uh, we're mainly only one, but as a strategist, Patty, I would just say that that presents enormous opportunities to you and me, um, because uh, it, it means that we're a little bit ahead of the curve. And, and we do think that the others will follow uh, very quickly indeed. So I would encourage future scientists to develop their competence um, because this is, a, this is a growing field. Um, on the second issue of indigenous knowledge systems, um, I, I, I'm so happy you asked that because we are sometimes uh, criticized that we, um, that we undermine the value of indigenous knowledge systems, quite the opposite. Uh, we believe that there is knowledge uh, in, embedded in Africa, which is in fact yet to be explored. And um, again, there's the classic dilemma, do you treat Africa as somehow separate or do you say that it's universal? And we do think that it's both. And there is, there is indigenous knowledge, such as the way that, that people engage, just the, the principle of communalism, the principle of collective decision making. These are things that the rest of the world is in fact grappling with. And you can see this in evidence in their politics. So we believe that a celebration of indigenous knowledge systems, both the way that knowledge is produced, but also the unearthing of currently existing knowledge in Africa is an opportunity for Africa. It may very well be an export of Africa, if you like. And I think that it's time that, that we study formally um, you know, the formation of those knowledge systems, because indeed, uh, in much of the West, the very nature of epistemology is being challenged. Um, now, I'm not here to argue that, that uh, classic Western science is, um, uh, is automatically flawed. That is clearly not the case. But I do think that there is an opportunity for a complementary approach between the epistemology uh, of Africa and uh, the classic, uh, what is typically reductionist analytical epistemology of the West. On how we raise awareness, um, it, it depends on who the audience is for the answer to this question. But if they, if they are policymakers, I, I, I have a very practical suggestion. And in fact, it comes from the way that commercial enterprises have uh, dealt with this issue. Even in commercial entities, there's a, there's a degree of um, kind of uh, uh, retarded uh, acceptance of new developments. And so, especially in very conservative entities that run on extremely high levels of, of bureaucracy. And one of the things that many international organizations have done to overcome that is to produce a separate entity for experimentation. Call it a think tank, uh, a laboratory, a futures lab, uh, something that's, that's created almost outside the bureaucracy of the system. And there's a deliberate theoretical underpinning for this proposal. And that is that if you simply introduce an alternative way of thinking into an extremely well-run, well-funded bureaucracy, the so-called antibodies of that bureaucracy kick in and new ideas you know, simply uh, die very quickly. They, they don't even get onto their feet. So the idea that the policymakers may, be a, may insist on a bit of budget, some resourcing, some infrastructure, 
for experimentation, for innovation, for design, uh, for laboratories. That, I think, is a fairly new idea, something that we certainly haven't seen a, a great deal of. And we're just seeing the early signs of that in some, some uh, private sector clients, very little of that um, yet in, in the public sector. I'm happy to take more questions. Um, and of course, Patty, there's, there's only so much I could say, you know, given our short time, but please feel free to ask a follow-up question. Yeah. No, thank you. Anyone else? Uh, I have a question. Yeah, this is Aguilino. Um, my question is actually regarding the lack of political will and the features looking uh, strategy on decision making. What, it, that is a problem which I share, and actually, that uh, the, the reasons that African leaders and African politics is looking at the past instead of in the in the uh, in the future is highly deterring the rise of uh, knowledge society in Africa, and mm -hmm. at the same time, it is also uh, highly paralyzing the 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 emergence of features thinking uh, in the continent of Africa. So I just have followed all your excellent explanations in this regard. But do you have every, do you have any suggestion to emerging African leaders with regard to possible strategies to tackle such things of lack of political will in the African context at this time, and uh, on how those ideas that you mentioned with regard to local knowledge or indigenous knowledge could be hybridized with the uh, universal knowledge and relationships. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. I, I think that, um, that, that we are seeing some examples of where uh, departments uh, such as uh, government departments, such as uh, the science and technology, for example, are actively seeking out uh, shining examples of uh, indigenous knowledge. Um, we, we don't see a great deal of it, but, but you know, th there are some examples that, uh, you know, think about, uh, there are a few sort of principles here, and many of them start with um, the knowledge and relationships of indigenous people with the environment. Now, this is a fascinating starting point as a possible export for Africa, because the, the people of Africa have an intuitive wisdom of the relationship with the environment. Think about the classic relationship with the, with the land, relationship with the river. Um, think about the, you know, not, not to generalize across cultures, but think about the phenomenon of the, the ancestors. Um, you know, what, what this does is it creates a kind of ecological awareness. And that means a systemic approach. So, as much as systems thinking, for example, is being formally studied in the West since around the 1940s, in Africa, to some degree, it is, it, it is in fact indigenous knowledge. In fact, we see many of the indigenous cultures being a lot more ecologically oriented. In other words, understanding the interconnections between things in their thinking. You know, China is another interesting example. So if you think of, you know, the great philosophers like Confucius, uh, who wrote the Analects, uh, Lao Tzu, um, who wrote the Tao Te Ching, um, uh, the Buddha, of course, it's really all about holism. And it's really fascinating uh, to us at the moment to observe how uh, the Chinese economy and the African economy are starting to move closer together. And we have a suspicion that it may be based on um, a connection uh, with a, a kind of deep ecological awareness. Now, of course, it's easy to criticize China's more recent uh, behavior uh, when it comes to their treatment of the environment and so on. But I think even in China, you're, you're seeing the re-emergence of a more um, uh, kind of ecological awareness. So, so I think there are some examples of where departments are actually sponsoring, they have active incentives for researchers to study 
local knowledge and to unearth the, the wisdom of local knowledge. Um, here in South Africa, for example, we've had a, a big campaign by students for, for uh, on something called Fees Must Fall, which was essentially a kind of call. One, one interpretation was that it was really a call for Africa to feature uh, in the higher education institutions on the continent, including here in our own country. Um, and I think what many people mean by that is that when you when you walk through many higher education institutions in Africa, they they when you're inside you couldn't say which continent you're on. Uh, you could be you could be anywhere in Europe, and so I think there's a there's a kind of reawakening of what's magical about Africa. But you know very practically now, I think these things have to be structured into incentivized research programs, uh, and this is a this is one very practical way. Uh, in which indigenous knowledge systems may um, may be celebrated as, as as we think they should, because remember, um, Western epistemological traditions are funded, they're sponsored, they're run on long-term projects. Why should African ind indigenous knowledge systems believe that or, or be believed to just naturally um, evolve and come to the fore? I think we have to be a little bit more aggressive, a little bit more assertive about. Um, about the way that uh, that Africa conceives of knowledge formation, knowledge production, and uh, and and actively fund research projects that make this connection uh, with the classic uh, Western knowledge tradition. If there is no other question, can I just add one more question? I, I think uh, David is on the uh, waiting, so can we give... Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Hello. Yes, yes uh, David, go ahead. Thank you very much, Dr. Moni, for the very, very inspiring, informative uh, talk that we have received this afternoon. Yeah. Indeed, I am so encouraged, especially where I work in the university. My question is, you talked about segmented, segregated thinking with regard to education that we need to think far, many, many years to come. Now, in an environment where the university has students from different uh, countries across Africa, but these countries are at different levels of development. How yeah. do you merge the curriculum so that it's able to fit and is able to be able to, to address the challenges of individual countries from wherever students are coming from? Thank you. Thank you, David. I, I think it's a complex question that you ask, but, but I think um, when it comes to curriculum um, development, one of the interesting yes. questions, one of the interesting paradigms is whether African, African nations all have to follow the same incremental development path. Or whether, mm -hmm. and this is an exciting idea to me, whether it is in fact possible for certain nations to have a kind of accelerated exponential leapfrogging approach to their economic development. So, you mm -hmm. know, as a practical example for the colleagues, you know, if the West went from pinafores in ships and communication technology to Morse code, to telegram, to landlines, to cordless phones, to mobile phones, to feature phones, to smartphones, Africa has the opportunity to go straight to the smartphone. So, I, I, you know, we don't have to, in other words, go through the same linear progression, all countries, all at the same time. I think that's, that's one dimension. And, and that means an active focus in curriculums on innovation. Mm -hmm. Rather than simply policy studies, for example, that try to, you know, understand traditional policy formation processes. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. The, the second thing that I would say is that I, I think there's a lot of opportunity, David, at, at universities 
when we work with multinationals, we also have the privilege here in South Africa to have various people from, from all over Africa. I think there's an opportunity that we're missing to unearth the wisdom of those countries represented in our universities mm -hmm. and to actively study the, the successes of those countries, even if they are predominantly unsuccessful, viewed even in objective terms. They're doing something right. Somewhere there's something to celebrate. And I, I don't think that we really have that kind of celebratory, appreciative, um, you know, research, deep curiosity of, you know, what each one of those countries bring. I think what we often try to do as academics, and this is deeply flawed, is we try to say, well, in a very pragmatic way, what has worked Typically, they're a Western example, and typically that's what informs our curriculum. So I think there's a, there's a real opportunity to rethink um, both the, the way in which we facilitate learning as well as the design of those curriculums with a much more aggressive focus on celebrating indigenous knowledge and with an active um, kind of uh, emphasis uh, on innovation, leapfrogging so that we don't all have to follow the same path. Thank you. Thank you. Colleagues or any other questions? Um, so uh, uh, can I just make a, an, an observation, uh, Centil and Dr. Mostert, uh, based on, 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 on the discussion today? It seems to me, uh, from what Dr. Monster has said, that there is a massive opportunity mm. Uh, mm. for uh, Africa in terms of developing its own brand of future studies, future research, future thinking, mm. and future decision making based approaches. That's right. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that is what we have to engage with collectively uh, through our uh, alumni, wherever they may find themselves, mm -hmm. but also uh, through various forums, conferences, uh, and so on. So I would also like to, and I hope you will uh, uh, forgive me for this or allow me to say this, but I would also... Uh, just make our alumni aware of the uh, uh, course that is offered by uh, Dr. Mostert's Institute. Uh, because whereas our course has uh, futures thinking and future studies as one of the aspects, Dr. Mostert's uh, course is focused on that. And I would uh, really like to refer them to, so Dr. Mostert, if you could share your um, uh, website uh, where uh, the alumni can find some information about uh, the course that you offer. And uh, just to say that uh, when uh, soon I would like to uh, also look at that course for myself. We would love to have you as a student. <laughs> 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 uh, we, we also, perhaps I could just also say that, um, you know, we, we also have an African Futures program that, that looks explicitly at, at the possible futures of, of the continent. Feel, feel free to engage with us. Okay. Uh, actually, so for, there are no further questions, then probably it's the time to wrap up. It's now close to one hour for the session. Okay. So, Thank, thank you very much, uh, Doctor, for uh, this very exciting session and also the blog. And we, we really look forward to work with you in the long run to see how we can collaborate at uh, uh, not only at individual level, at institutional level. So we really look forward to work with you. So on behalf of Jesse and myself, all my colleagues and alumni of our LSET program, we really thank you very much for this session. Thank you so much. I've absolutely loved it. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you everybody. Bye. Thanks for the session. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Mostert. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.
Yes. 